All right. So welcome everyone to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Intro to Soil Health and Soil Testing for the Farm. Um, a few logistics before we get started. If you haven't already, make sure to go through the audio setup wizard. It just takes a few seconds. It's under the tools uh, menu at the top left of your screen. Um, also, your mics are going to be muted during this presentation, um, so please use the chat box um, to type questions as we go along. Heather is going to try and pick those up as we go, and anything that gets missed we'll catch at the end. Um, also, put your, I think most of you have already put your email address in, so that's great. Uh, we will send you follow-up information after the presentation. So, our presenter this evening is uh, Dr. Heather Darby, UVM Extension Agronomist and Soil Specialist. Heather has been developing the Northwest Crops and Soils program since she came to, the UV to UVM six years ago and provides leadership to the team. Heather's passion for sustainable agriculture and the enthusiasm she receives from Vermont's farmers and professionals has fueled the expansion of her program. So we're lucky to have her here with us this evening sharing her knowledge. Welcome, Heather. Hi. This is my first webinar, so I'm really excited about it. It's kind of definitely different talking to my computer, but um, usually when I'm doing that, I'm not saying very nice things either. But um, so I just want to welcome everybody tonight to the, the soils webinar, and I hope everyone's excited to learn about soils. And I want to make sure, I know this is the New Farmer Network, so if you definitely, if you have questions, please ask. I want to make sure that you're learning uh, what you need to know about how to take care of your soils. And I appreciate everyone taking the time to get on the webinar tonight because I also own a farm as well as work for Extension. I know how hard it is to take the time to do these types of things, but hopefully you'll find it useful. Um, I get a learn, let's see here, how to operate this thing. There we go. So the first thing I was going to show you is um, my program website. And there is a manual on the website. And I just put up the slide. It shows the email address. And I think I can type this in here, too. It's www.uvm.edu slash extension slash crop soil. And I think it can take me there. There we go. And uh, this is my website. And there is some uh, manual, as I said, on soil and building healthy soils and nutrient management. So it's a little bit geared towards dairy farmers, but a lot of the principles are, uh, you know, really for any farm. So after the, comp the webinar tonight, you know, please feel free to go there and download that. There's lots of information there as well on mostly forages, grains, oil seeds. We have a hops program as well. Um, so hopefully you'll find some interesting information there. Let me go back to my slides. So what I wanted to do is start by talking about healthy soils in general, what that means, and then um, characteristics of a healthy soil, and then get into soil testing, how to take a soil test, and interpreting a soil test. I noticed on the map there was one person from uh, Massachusetts, and I'm not sure if we use the same soil testing as uh, UMass, but I think the, the principles are de definitely the same. So healthy soil in general, you know, there's just some characteristics of it. And as a, as a new farmer, I'm hoping that if you learn one thing from this webinar, you learn that soil is, is really the basis of your farm. And in order to be a successful farmer, you really need to create a healthy soil to grow good productive crops as well as healthy animals and hopefully um, a viable living at the end of the day. So a healthy soil, it has sufficient nutrients. That is really, really important. You want enough for the crop, but you don't want an excess. Excess can lead to diseases and also pollution. So enough nutrients, but not too much. Good tilth. Hopefully a lot of you know what that means. Um, if you've been out to your fields and you pick up the soil, and it's just a clump of mud, <laughs> and it all is just a big block that sticks together, then it, ha it has poor tilth. If you pick it up and it crumbles in your hand, then it has nice tilth. Sufficient depth, you need a place for the plants to root. Uh, good water storage and drainage. This is really important, especially with climate change. 
you want uh, to be able to store water when we're going through these droughty periods like we've had this summer. And when we go through the wet periods like we've had this summer, you also want to have soils that drain really well. And a healthy soil can do both, actually. Um, you also want to have a soil that's free of chemicals that might harm your plants. And of course, um, that's something that's pretty easy to accomplish, especially if you're not using uh, chemicals, pesticides. Healthy soil also has low populations of plant disease and parasitic organisms. Um, you know, soils can, can have a lot of benefits to plants, and one of them is disease suppression. We can't cover a lot of that in tonight's talk. We don't have enough time, but healthy soils can suppress diseases. A healthy soil also will have high populations of organisms that actually help plant growth. There are organisms out there like mycorrhizal fungi that can improve the growth of your plants. Healthy soils usually have low weed pressure as well. Um, sometimes that's a little hard to believe. I know I feel like we have healthy soils on our farms and we have a really great crop of weeds, but good soil management can lead to low weed pressure. Um, healthy soils also are resistant to being degraded, which means that when you have heavy rains or you till the soil lightly when they're healthy, they're not going to wash away into the, into the water. And you can see here in the picture, this is um, healthy, kind of healthy soil and non-healthy soil. And right here, uh, oops, let me see if I can use my pointer. Highlighter. We'll try this. All right. Look at this. What a great tool. So right here on the left, you can see this is that block of soil I was talking about. Um, it's just a big hunk. And this is a soil that had been conventionally plowed for many, many years. And to the right here, different color. here's a handful of soil that's nice and crumbly right next to each other, these two plots. And you can see that the soil to the right has good soil tilth, probably smells better. The water and plants are going to be able to, water's going to be able to drain through that and plants are going to be able to grow through that, unlike the soil to the left. So what we're really trying to accomplish is what we have here on the right. So how are we going to do that? That's, that's the big question, especially if you're just getting going. And the thing about soils is that for years anyway, farmers have been mostly instructed on how to take care of the nutrients in your soil, how to supply nutrients to your plants, how to give them nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And I, I would say that's something that the university has been really good at. Uh, we've been really good at making nutrient recommendations for, for crops. But where we, we failed a little bit and we're getting better at is really helping farmers manage their, their soil as a system and looking at more than the chemical side of soil, where we're helping farmers learn how to manage the biological properties of their soil, the physical properties, and the chemical properties. You need to do a good job with all three of these components to really build a healthy soil. So you can add sometimes all the nutrients that your crop needs but if you're not um, taking care of the physical properties and the biological properties, you're still not going to get those yields. I drive by and visit many fields across Vermont, and the farmers constantly say, well, I, I gave it this much nitrogen, I, I fed it this much phosphorus, and it still looks terrible. And part of the problem is that the soil's compacted and it's leading to poor crops. So in order for us to really have healthy soil, healthy plants, um, we need to pay attention to all three of these. All right. So one of the, the principal components of soil that I like to talk about is soil organic matter. And soil organic matter is really at the heart of all three of these aspects of soil. So soil organic matter can help improve the biological, the chemical, and the physical properties of your soil. So if I can, I guess this is the second thing I'm going to tell you to, to take home, is that managing your soil organic matter will pay off huge benefits for your soil in all three of these realms. It not only will help um, give the soil nutrients that it needs, but it will feed the biology, and it will also help build the physical properties that you want on your so in your soil. 
So that's what we're going to talk about first, soil organic matter. All right, so here's another long list of things that uh, soil organic matter influences in your soil. So organic matter can influence many properties in your soil, and you can see here's a list. It can influence nutrient availability, aggregation, or that soil tilth, okay? It can help with water storage. It can create a diversity of organisms. Um, it can improve soil color. It's kind of an odd one to think about, but the darker your soils are, the faster they heat up. So that's actually a pretty important um, aspect that or soil organic matter helps. It can help um, build the presence of growth stimulating compounds we talked about, and it's really important in the whole scheme of the global climate cycle as well. Now remember, I know I'm going pretty fast. I'm talking into my computer, so I'm not sure what I'm <laughs> how I'm actually supposed to, to be going, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. All right, so let's talk about organic matter in a little more detail. It's not quite as simple um, as just talking about organic matter itself. All right, following me. I'm typing a question for you. And you can just um, hit your smiley face or your thumb up or your thumb down. I'm going <laughs> to... Yes, all right, good. All right, oh good, okay, we're getting there. <laughs> I'm following myself, but see, that's just me. All right, let's keep going. Maybe I haven't figured out how to hit your little smiley faces, but thank you. Okay, all right, so there's really three types of organic matter in your soils. Like I said, it's not just organic matter. There's, um, these were phrases coined by Fred, Fred Magdoff, who, who many of you may know. Um, organic matter can have three different types in the, in the soil. There's the living, the dead, and the very dead. And each aspect or each component of organic matter plays a very important role in your soil. So first, the living. Everybody knows that the soil is alive. If your soil is not alive, it's not going to be very productive. So you really want to encourage life in your soil, and again, um, by feeding the soil different types of organic matter, you can encourage um, earthworms, you can encourage different bacteria, fungi, protozoa, all the life in the soil that's beneficial to your crops. Whoop. Sorry about that. All right. There's lots of interesting things going on in your soil, uh, things that we can't see, things that scientists know very little about. But again, if you build the life in your soil, if you build the microbes, there are lots of benefits to be gained. And here's just one example of um, a fungi that strangles nematodes in the soil. It's a little violent, so if you have small children in the room, you may not want them to be looking at the screen. But you can see right here, this is the fungi. It makes a little noose, and then it strangles. You can see over here, it strangles the nematode. And this, these are things that are going on in the soil all the time, things we don't necessarily see. But what you have to believe is that if you have highly biological or micro, lots of microbial life in your soil, um, this is happening, these relationships. Uh, we have bigger insects that are really important. I know someone called the Extension Office the other day and they mentioned there were all these little black beetles running around in their garden, and what should they do about them? These carabid beetles right here that I'm showing, um, they are, th these insects are essential to actually transporting and breaking down organic matter on the surface of the soil so that it becomes available to the microbes down below. And I think um, so if you see these in your garden, they're actually, or in your, on your farm, they're very beneficial and we need them. So there's larger insects that we can see that actually will break down organic matter on the surface for the fungi and the nematodes to eat below. All right, let's move on. So we have the living, very important. Uh, they're breaking down organic matter to feed the other microbes. And then we have the dead. So the living and now on to the dead. 
the dead is recently dead soil organisms and crop residues. So compost that you might apply to the soil, um, cow manure, other, other residues uh, from your garden or your vegetables that are left there. And these recently, uh, recently dead crop materials and organisms are what provide the food to the living. Okay? So the recently dead feed the living organisms. This is called the active organic matter. And it's actively feeding the organisms in your soil. So if you want to have a lot of microorganisms in your soil, you need to feed them. And what they need to be fed is relatively um, undecomposed organic matter that you will add in the form of compost, manures, um, crop residues, etc. Uh-oh. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Isn't that not good? Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> what a bummer. All right. Okay. Here we go. Here's a picture of what active organic matter looks like. And the active organic matter you can see still resembles plant material. So again, it's really that the new organic matter that you're adding to your soil every year or every couple of years. So it's, there's still something there for the microbes to feed on. All right, here's an up-close picture of it. And again, you can still see plant particles in there. There's still food for those microbes. That's why it's active. Okay. Um, one of the interesting, I guess, aspects of organic matter that we hear a lot about is that this is what stores carbon in soil. And we hear a lot about uh, the carbon in the soil because of global climate change. And as soil is plowed and opened up by farmers, the, the soil organic matter breaks down and there's a release of carbon into the atmosphere. We could um, carbon offsets. Yes, we could. <laughs> so this is actually a picture. Um, this is the part or the aspect of organic matter okay, that gets released when we plow the soil. So I guess you kind of have to picture this. This is under a microscope. But this piece, this chunk of organic matter here is surrounded by soil particles, so silt and clay. This is what we call um, trapped organic matter or a, uh, secluded, occluded organic matter. And when you till the soil and break this organic matter up it's, that's once trapped and not available to microorganisms, um, that's what gets readily blown off into the atmosphere. So once this trapped organic matter gets opened up through plowing or rototilling, it's instantly made available to organisms, and then they eat it, and carbon dioxide gets released into the atmosphere. So the more, and this is kind of how it works, the more microbes you have in the soil, the better chance of organic matter getting stuck in between soil particles because the microbes put out glues that stick all this material together. The more protected or trapped organic matter you'll build in your soil, and basically the more carbon you will sequester. This is actually sequestered carbon. And it, it's not hard to unsequester, um, but you can sequester carbon through good soil management. All right. So we have the living. Okay, those are the microbes. The dead, that's the material that you're just recently added to the soil. Okay, the dead feeds the microbes. And then we have the very dead. And the very dead is what a lot of people, people generally actually refer to organic matter as humus sometimes. But the very dead organic matter is actually what is called humus in the scientific literature. Okay, and human humus is something that contains a very 
um, high negative charge. So if anybody has ever heard of the cation exchange capacity, which we'll talk about in detail in a little bit, the cation exchange capacity is highly impacted by the amount of very dead organic matter in your soil. So the more um, well decomposed organic matter, the higher amount of negative charge in your soil and the more negative charge you have, the greater ability your soil has to hang on to nutrients. And we'll talk about that. Okay, this is what it looks like. This is the very dead organic matter. And very dead means that it was probably materials that were added 50 plus years ago. It's very hard to get rid of um, in the soil. Generally, when you look at a graph of organic matter release, Let's say this point right here, um, it would be sod. So an old sod that had never been plowed. And once you open that soil up, the amount of organic matter in that soil drops drastically. Okay, And this is the release of all that organic matter that was once protected. And then the organic matter sort of levels off. Okay. And why it levels off is because the stable organic matter is very hard to get rid of. It's very hard to lose that over time, okay? Because the microbes are not eating it. It's not being blown off into the atmosphere. It's fairly stable in your soil. Okay. So if we're looking at soil organic matter on your farm, this is sort of how, how your pie chart would look. Most of the organic matter in your soil is the very dead. That's 60 to 80 percent of all the organic matter you have in your soil. All right? And the smaller quantity of organic matter is in the active form and the living form. So what happens is many times farmers are really trying to improve their organic matter levels. And they will add compost or, or cover crops. They'll start cover cropping. And in another year, they will take a organic uh, soil test and they get their organic matter levels back. And they haven't changed. It's still 4%. It's been 4% for five years and I just can't get it to change. Okay? And the reason for that is that most of your organic mat that you're adding is this active organic matter. And it makes up such a small fraction of the total that it's sometimes really hard to see changes in a standard soil test. So if this is happening to you, don't, don't be depressed. You probably are making leaps and strides in building organic matter. It's just sometimes hard to detect. So what, I'm going to write this here, what type of soils do folks have on their farms. If I could get a few responses, that would be great. So when I say type, do you have sand? There we go, sand. Sandy soils, clay soils. Oh, you guys have really sandy soils. So, so all right, we've got two sandy soils. Does anybody have a clay soil? Same. Hmm. Nope, nobody from Ah, there we go. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> so if you are on a sandy soil, generally your organic matter levels are fairly low. They are probably 2 to 3 percent. Um, if you have a very sandy soil and you have an organic matter level of 4 percent, then you are, you are doing something right. It is very hard to increase organic matter in a sandy soil. In a clay soil, it is, really, um, it is really hard to get rid of organic matter. And the reason for that is, we'll go back to this picture right here, in a sandy soil, sands have no negative charge. Okay? And they also don't have a lot of places where there's protected organic matter because the size of the soil particles are, are quite a bit larger than in a clay. So there's, there's really no room for organic matter, no place for organic matter to hide from the microbes. 
So as soon as it's put into the soil, it is generally eaten um, or lost to the atmosphere very quickly. And that's why it's hard to build organic matter in a sandy soil. Now in clay soils, you have smaller particle size. There's lots of negative charges, so things are held together, okay? And you get a lot of trapped organic matter. And so the organic matter is held onto in the clay soil. So in a sandy soil, if you're adding organic matter, okay, you can sometimes see changes because there's not much there to begin with. In a clay soil, it's even harder to see changes because you have a lot of the old stuff, okay? Clay soils in Vermont should be 4 to 5 percent. And it shouldn't be too hard for you get, to get those soils to 6 percent organic matter. So what are your organic matter levels? So hopefully everybody will be really ready to go get their soils tested when we get done. <laughs> and hopefully, maybe we can even help you with that a little bit. All right, so, so it's really important for you to, to know your organic matter levels. And I think that's one of the things that actually excites a lot of farmers is to hopefully watch their soils improve over time and you're just getting started. So what an opportunity to really see where you're starting from and really monitor how you grow in the future. And I know we've done some of that on our farm. Um, we take soil tests every three years to see how things are changing and to really get a handle on if we're doing a good job or not. So let's keep going. All right, so the living and the dead organic matter. So remember, the microbes and the food the microbes eat is what, um, is what drives nutrient cycling in your soil, okay? And what that means is, especially if you're an organic farmer, how many people are organic farmers here? I got it, there we go, check. I got to get my check there. Yes, okay. There we go. So it looks like many people are organic. Okay, so especially if you're organic, and even if you're not organic, you really need to pay attention to this because fertilizer is expensive. And if you can naturally release nutrients in your soil, then not only will it be cheaper uh, for you as a, as a farmer, but it's also the most effective way to supply nutrients to your crop. So remember, if you have a highly diverse microbial population, and in order to get that, you have to feed them, then they will eat the material that you're feeding to them and the material that you're feeding to them will be decomposed and those nutrients okay, will be released into the soil and they'll be used by your microbes but also used by your plants. Okay, So you have to have organic matter and you have to have the microbes to make this happen. Um, one of the, so I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple of relationships here. One of the relationships in the soil between microbes and plants is mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see right here, see those kind of white tips on these roots? That's the mycorrhizae. And the mycorrhizae, there's also mycorrhizae over here. Okay, you can see the root system there. And what the mycorrhizae do is they expand the surface area of your rooting system on your plants. And what the mycorrhizae do is they protect your plants from diseases. 
but they also help your plants have more access to soil nutrients, especially those nutrients that don't move readily in your soil. All right, so one nutrient in particular that does not move is phosphorus. So if you have some of these mycorrhizal relationships on your plants, they will help you access uh, nutrients like phosphorus. Okay, most mycorrhizal relationships, because people are probably wondering, do I have these? How do I know if I have these? Um, we see a lot of these relationships on perennial plants. Uh, they're very important in crops like blueberries, raspberries, even some strawberries. We don't often see mycorrhizal relationships on, on row crops like corn uh, for, for really the basic reason um, that we already give them enough nutrients usually. Okay, So a relationship like this or this one, which I hope you all know, only happens if you're not already giving the plant the nutrients that it needs. Okay, So you're not always going to have a mycorrhizal relationship because if you're fertilizing your plants properly, your plants won't form that relationship. So right here is a, is, uh, a legume and these are nodules on the legume. Does everybody, I'm sure you all know that legumes, a legume is clover, alfalfa, beans, peas, they ha build a, relation a relationship, a beneficial relationship with a bacteria in the soil called one of the bacteria is rhizobium. And when they form this relationship, uh, the bacterium basically makes a home on the plant root and the bacterium supplies the plant with nitrogen and in return, the plant supplies the bacterium with carbon and sugar, okay? It's a two-way relationship. Now, if you give the beans or you give the soybeans or you give the alfalfa enough nitrogen, then it will not form this relationship, okay? This plant, this, these legumes and this relationship is very important uh, for all farmers and especially new farmers to understand because if you are organic, using legumes in your rotation, so crops like clover, okay, again, or sweet clover um, as, a, as a rotation crop will provide, when it's plowed down, nitrogen for your next crop, okay? Nitrogen is one of the only nutrients, it actually is the only nutrient that we can produce on our farms with a plant. All right, we can buy phosphorus, we can buy potassium, okay, we cannot make them ourselves, but we can make nitrogen. This is very powerful. This is something that all new farmers really need to know about because this as an organic farmer is how you're going to get enough nitrogen for your plants. If you're trying to supply all the nitrogen for your crops, with let's say chicken manure, all right, chicken manure, let me just type this in here, chicken manure has an analysis of, I think it's a 4, 3, 3, okay? Okay, so a 4, 3, 3 means that when you apply chicken manure, you get some nitrogen, 4% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, and 3% of that is potassium. You might not, and in many cases, you may not need phosphorus and potassium, okay? So, but you need that nitrogen. And a good way to really just get nitrogen on your farm is through these legume crops, okay? So this will be hopefully something that you'll be thinking about adding to your crop and your crop rotation. All right, here we go. One last uh, plant relationship that I want to talk about that has to do with mycorrhizae and the rhizobia is the fact that mycorrhizal fungi can connect plants on your farm. Again, especially perennials. If you're growing forages, let's say, or a cover crop that has grasses in it and legumes, uh, the mycorrhizae right here that are on the grasses 
okay, create these hyphal highways. So they attach to the legumes and they transport nitrogen. So the, the legumes transport nitrogen to the grasses through the mycorrhizae and the grasses transport phosphorus through the mycorrhizae to the legumes. Okay. So really starting to understand some of these relationships such as the legumes and the rhizobium and the fact that the grasses and the legumes can work together will help you really build an effective soil management program on your farm. All right. So again, as your organic matter, the active organic matter, all right, so if, if actually, we, we should talk about this quick. If you go out and buy a bag of, and I'm only saying the product name because I know that it's very well decomposed. If you go out and buy a bag of Moodoo, okay, I think most people know what that is. It's a highly um, composted. It's composted for a very long time. And if you add that to your soil, okay, it's more like stable organic matter. So if you're adding a really old compost, something that's been com highly composted, there's not a lot for your microbes to eat there. All right? So the type of organic matter that you add to the soil will influence, again, what the microbes have to eat and how much a nutrient, how many nutrients become available. So if you add um, highly composted manure, this thing doesn't really work like a pen, but that, that's not working. If you use highly composted manure, you're not going to get many nutrients, okay, from that. So this is a mistake that a lot of new farmers make. They want to add compost to their soil because compost is miraculous. It does all kinds of great things, and they hear so much about it. But really, materials that are composted for long periods of time have benefits to your soil. There's no doubt about it. But you should not be using those as a nutrient source, okay? Because it's going to take a lot of it to get, let's say, the nitrogen that you need for your corn crop, all right? So if you're looking for nutrients from organic matter, you need to add something that's less decomposed. So that would be cover crops. You know, they're very green when you plow them under. There's lots of nutrients there. It would be um, lightly decomposed or lightly composted materials, uh, like some of this poultry manure that's available. That's lightly decomposed usually. Um, raw manure, of course, if you can use that, that's uh, lightly decomposed as well. So you need to think about what kind of organic matter you're adding to make sure you actually get nutrients that you need. All right. So I wanted to show you the nitrogen life cycle because nitrogen is probably one of the most limiting nutrients on any person's farm. And it doesn't matter <laughs> if you're conventional or organic, it generally is the limiting nutrient. Plants use a lot of nitrogen to make protein, et cetera, in, in, their, um, in their systems. And so, you know, they use a lot of it. So I wanted to talk about it again because it's a nutrient that we can make on our farms. But the other thing about nitrogen is it's the only nutrient that's 100% controlled by biology. And I'll talk about that. All right, so let's just go through the nitrogen um, nutrient cycle. So right here, I don't like that color. Why don't you go with it? No, this color. All right. Organic nitrogen. This is mostly what uh, many of you are applying if you're organic. You're applying manure, cow manures, composted livestock manures, uh, cover crops. That's organic nitrogen. Okay, that means that the nitrogen is attached to carbon. And in order for it to be, um, for your plants to utilize it, it must be broken down into a plant available form. All right, your plants cannot break down 
the organic nitrogen. Your microbes that you are feeding will break that into a form for your plants, okay? So the breakdown of organic nitrogen into ammonium, NH4+, plus, many of you have probably heard that, ammonium, which is a plant available form of nitrogen, happens through a process called mineralization. And it takes microbes to do that, to convert organic nitrogen to ammonium, okay? So if you have no microbes in your soil, you will not break down your organic matter, all right? Okay, so this ammonium can be taken up by your plants, right here, directly, or it will be further broken in, down into a, the nutrient, nutrient, no, uh, into nitrates, okay? So it will be broken down from ammonium into nitrites and then into nitrates. This is all done through two bacteria. So if you, again, do not have these bacteria in your soil, this will not happen. So you need the microbial life to make the nitrogen cycle happen. So <clears throat> it, for the most part, plants do not like to take up ammonium. It's actually more work for them to process it. So you can see that ammonium is NH4+. Plus. And in order for plants to utilize that, they have to get rid, rid of some of those hydrogens. And that takes work and it takes energy. So the plants would rather take up nitrates. That's the preferred form, okay? So if there's nitrates laying around, they're going to definitely take those up before the ammonium. All right, so let's move on. See, we're already kind of running out of time. All right, so again, your living and your dead organic matter that's what drives nutrient cycling. The very dead organic matter also plays a role in uh, nutrient availability, okay? Again, the microbes do not eat this very decomposed organic matter. But, as I mentioned before, the very dead organic matter has a negative charge. And you can see right here, the negative charge, this is a piece of organic matter, in case you didn't figure that out yet, okay? Now, the other, the other uh, part of your soil, I see Shannon, I think, in particular, had clay soil, okay? The other component of your soil that has a negative charge are your clay particles. So clays and organic matter both have negative charges. Right? Now, what's so great about negative charge? Why do we keep talking about that? Many of the nutrients in the soil, many of the nutrients your crop needs, actually have positive charges. Right? So if you can kind of picture this, let me see what the next slide is here. Here we go. This is a good picture. So if you can kind of picture this, you have, there's, soil, there's water in your soil. Correct? Probably for some of us there's too much right now. And in that soil solution, there are nutrients in there. All right? There's um, all the nutrients we've already been talking about. There's nitrogen, there's potassium, there's calcium, magnesium. All the nutrients that your crops need to grow are in that soil solution. Now, if they're just in the soil solution and water moves down through the soil, it percolates through the soil, what is going to happen to those nutrients? Okay, you can probably picture it. And there's nothing, let's just say this is a soil solution here. If there's nothing there growing, or if the crops were not taking them up and water moves down, you can imagine that these nutrients would just percolate through the soil and end up in the groundwater. All right, so how do we keep that from happening? So first of all, we have plants growing, and the plants, okay, will take up some of these nutrients. This is my great artistic work. Here's these little roots. Okay, they will take up some of the nutrients out of the soil solution. But, you know, they can't take up everything at one time. Many plants are growing for, you know, months, 
And so they take only a few nutrients up at a time. So how else are we going to hold on to those nutrients? All right. So again, these nutrients have a positive charge. And your soil has a negative charge if you have organic matter in clay. So as you probably learned when you were students in the second grade, opposites attract. That's where I learned it anyway. And so your, your hydrogens, your calcium, magnesium, ammonium, sodium, potassium, and many of the micronutrients will be held in your soil by your organic matter particles and your clay particles. This is called the cation exchange capacity. Okay? The cation exchange capacity is the ability for your soils to hold on to positively charged nutrients. If you have a low cation exchange capacity, then you are at greater risk of losing nutrients through into the groundwater, through your soil, than if you have a high cation exchange capacity. All right? So if you have a clay soil or a soil with lots of organic matter, then you have lots of negative charge and hence would naturally have a higher cation exchange capacity. Now, it looked like many of you had sandy soils. And I saw one person had 1.6% organic matter. And if you look at, this looks like the purple burdock farm. If you look at your soil test, um, if you have it in front of you, could you tell me what your cation exchange capacity is? I bet, I would imagine that it's pretty low. If your, if your organic matter is 1.6%, your cation exchange capacity is probably less than 10. Okay? So another good reason to build organic matter is so that you can hold on to these nutrients in your soil. Okay? Especially if you're adding nutrients. Yeah, two and a half. That's very, it's pretty low. So that, this is why you want to, and in your case, in a sandy soil, let me go back to this slide here, okay? Um, in a sandy soil, probably 100% of your cation exchange capacity is due to organic matter because there's probably no clay in there, all right? So it's even more important if you have light textured soils to keep adding that organic matter so you can build the negative charge to hold on to your nutrients, all right? Okay. All right, so um, let's talk about pH a little bit. Now, this is probably, if, you, if you're going to spend any money on your farm fertilizing the ground, the best money spent, and if you're working with any old time farmers, they'll tell you the same thing, lime is your cheapest source of fertilizer, okay? Um, the pH of your soil, so how acidic or basic it is, will highly influence, okay, how available many of your nutrients are. So let's just look at the soil pH range right here. So 5 is considered an acid soil. Unless you're growing cranberries, of course, or blueberries, then you would want something that's more acidic, okay? And but most, most of our crops grow best in this range, 6 to 7 pH, okay? When you go out and take your soil test tomorrow, um, right, and you get your test in a week, the first thing I want you to look at is that pH, okay? Because this is something you can change rather quickly and for not much money, and this will have the biggest impact um, right away on your crop production. Many soils in Vermont are acidic, okay? And I have seen so many farms have problems growing crops because they're down here in the five range, okay? Your plants cannot grow, especially your legumes, if you're trying to grow clover, et cetera, cannot grow in that soil pH. You really need to get your pHs between six and seven. Ideally, I would shoot for 6.2 to 6.8 <laughs> if you want to get specific, okay? 
and I will talk about why. Now, when you get up into this really high range here, seven and a half, eight, where I live in Vermont, I live in the Lake Champlain Islands, um, we, ha we can have pHs this high, and this isn't good either. Um, Vermont, uh, Vermont's high acidity uh, generally do, somebody asked us, you know, why does Vermont have high acid soils? And it's because of, um, we have, a, most of the Vermont soils are spodosol soils, which means they were basically mostly forested at one time, and the type of trees that were grown on those grounds um, created more acidic soils. So it's mostly about a time before us. But, um, aha, yes, okay. So good. But there are places in Vermont, such as the Champlain Valley, all right, so if you live in the Champlain Valley or in the islands, your pHs usually are 6.8 and sometimes 7.5. All right, so let's move to the next slide. So this is why you need to keep your pHs in this optimum range. Remember I was saying, okay, here we go, 6.2. Oh, shoot, i got to get my eraser. You really want them to yes. my answer. Okay, here we go again. All right, you really want to be right around here. All right, so you can see with phosphorus in particular that the more acidic your soil is, the less available phosphorus is, okay? And on the other end as well, the more, the more basic your soils are, again, the less phosphorus available. Same with most of the nutrients, all right? When it's too acidic, there's not a lot available, and if it's too basic, there's not a lot of some of these other nutrients available. So really, sort of the best of all worlds happens between 6.2 and 6.8, all right? Once you get too basic, you start to become deficient in some of the micronutrients. Um, and in some cases, actually, once you're too basic, you may have too much of a micronutrient release, and you could, this could lead to toxicities as well. So it's very, very important to make sure you get your pHs um, in that range. All right, so this is just a little list of what happens if you have alkaline, if you have soils that are too acidic or too basic. In Vermont, um, our acidity in Vermont is caused by aluminum. Let me go back here. Well, I'll just... Let's just say in Vermont, our acidity is primarily caused by aluminum. And aluminum is Al3+, okay? And in some, in some states, not necessarily here, most acidity is caused by hydrogen, has one plus, okay? If you live in Vermont, and, and when you, again, when you go out and get your... Uh, soil test there tomorrow and you get your recommendation back from UVM, you can look at the aluminum level on your soil test because in Vermont we show you aluminum because it is a problem here, all right? If you have high aluminum soil, then you probably have low pH because this is causing it to be acidic and you probably will need to add a good amount of lime to change that, right? Now, why you need to add more lime is because of this 3 plus right here. Uh, this just means that the aluminum basically is really tough and it's very hard to get out of your soils. So you have to add a lot of lime to remove the aluminum from your soil. If you have low aluminum and still have a low pH, okay, your acidity is probably caused by hydrogen. And it only has one plus. So it's pretty easy to kick this off your soil, okay, with the lime. That's probably more detail than you wanted, but that's how it works. All right, let's skip this a little bit because we already talked about it. These are different liming agents that you can buy as a farmer. And if you're a small-scale farmer, you know, you're probably going to get bags of um, calcium carbonate. This is very, very common. Well, this 
right here, calcitic agricultural lime is probably the most common. This is what you can buy in a bag um, at your ag dealership or at a even a hardware store. You can buy this. So you'll probably be applying this material to your soil to acidify it. If you need to acidify your soil, you need to start now. Okay, so if you get your soil test back and it says you need to apply lime, don't wait till next spring to do it. You need to do it this fall so that the lime has time to react in your soil and bring the pH up. So do not wait until next spring uh, when you're really busy doing everything else anyway. Uh, it's not going to change the, the lime a whole lot. Would adding the Selma material with clay help with sandy soils? I'm not familiar with the Selma material. Could you describe that a little bit more, Jessica? I've never even heard of it. Is it on here? Oh, right here. Got it. Chalk Marl. Yes, it would. Yes. The clay would, if you're adding the clay, it would definitely help with the sandy soils. But you would probably have to add so much. Um, I'm not sure. With the amount that you're going to add for the lining material, it may not make a whole lot of difference. But good question, definitely. All right, um, some people have low magnesium levels also in their soil. And if you have low magnesium, you would, you would add dolomitic lime. Because you can see right here, dolomitic lime has magnesium in it. All right, so how long does lime take to incorporate into the soil and raise pH? Generally, you need to give it a year. So it's a year if you're incorporating it. All right, now if you're dealing with pastures or hay ground and you're not plowing or even a perennial crop and you're not plowing the field, then it could take a couple of years, okay, because the lime laying on the surface of the ground has to get down into the soil to react, all right? Uh, if we plant a cover crop after liming, will those crops do all right? Yes. You just want to make sure, uh, well, it depends on the crop. So most people plant winter rye. What kind of cover crop are you planting? I can tell you probably better through that. Yes, well, if you're, okay, so winter rye is actually a, cro a cover crop that can grow well under a pH of 5.5. <laughs> so it's one of those crops that can do fairly well under many conditions. So the, so the rye, the winter rye, wouldn't have a lot of trouble growing um, under a low pH, but your clover will. If your pH is below 6, the clover will struggle. Um, in most cases, it will probably you know, still grow around 5.8, but it won't do all that well. Okay, let's move on here. So this is, uh, when you line your soil, I just wanted to, to give you a picture of what actually happens. So here's your soil particle right here, and you can see the negative charges on your soil, all right? So what's holding on to that negative charge is this hydrogen. And this hydrogen is what's creating the acidity, right? So if you had more calciums here, if you had more calciums, magnesiums, um, and potassiums, you would actually have a more basic soil. But because you have more hydrogens, it's more acidic. So how do you get rid of the hydrogen? Um, and basically through brute force. <laughs> you lime the soil with calcium carbonate or another liming material and it's stronger and there's more of it when you apply it and it essentially boots off through brute force again and kind of mass overload. It boots off the hydrogens, okay, so now instead of hydrogens on your negative charge you have calcium. It boots off the hydrogens, the calciums get on your, your soil particles, now it's become more basic. And as a result of that, you get water, the production of water, and you get some CO2 release into the soil. Okay, so that's how liming works in your soil. All right, so let's talk a little bit about soil tilth, and then we'll get into it's 8 o'clock. How much, how long do we keep going, Jessica? I don't want to go over my time. I hate to say it, Heather, but we're supposed to be wrapping up right about now. Um. All right, so hold. <laughs> well, let me, um, uh, can I just, well, I guess what, that's up what, what I would yeah. say here, um, everybody is on a different schedule. Um, I know I'm getting a lot out of uh, Heather's uh, presentation here, so 
Uh, people who want to stay, please stay. We'll let Heather uh, wrap up here. And if you need to go, um, don't feel uh, shy about leaving the room. And we will be able to send this presentation, um, or we'll be posting this uh, presentation on our website, so you'll be able to catch the end of it if you want to at another time, if you have something else to do. So um, Heather, keep on going. And uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess sorry about that. There's so much to say about soils. You know, this should be a two-part webinar. But um, just quickly about soil structure. If you want to have microbes in your soil, you got to give them a good place to live. Okay, and you know, just feeding them the organic matter really isn't enough. You know, it's like if you have pets, you can't just feed them some food and water out on a cold day. You need to make sure they have a good place to hang out and. You know, it's the same with your microbes and the same with your plant roots. So they need a soil that has really good structure to live in. If your soil is compacted, you're not going to have any microbes no matter how much you try to feed them, okay? So soil structure essentially is um, your soil is not all lumped together. Here's a picture of poor soil structure. You see there's no space in there. It's just all these soil particles just pressed together. This is poor soil structure, and if you ran a tractor over the top of this a lot, or you were using your overusing your rototiller, which a lot of us do, um, and I'm guilty of that too, it breaks up your soil particles, and then you get this little mess here. Now, what you want is you want your soil particles to kind of be loosely held together. Okay, you want them clumped together in aggregates, but then loosely piled on top of each other so that you have air space. And there's room here for air, and there's room here for plant roots, and water movement, and all of these great things that we need from our soil. So remember, I said at the beginning, you not only need those nutrients, but you also need the physical and biological properties in your soil. They're not separate. They're all kind of working together. So you can't just work on one and, um, and, not, and not the other. How placement within a watershed affects all this. Uh, what do you mean? I don't, I'm not quite understanding the question. It would be interesting to know how placement within a watershed affects all this. You mean good and bad soils? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, I won't pay any attention. All right, so you're living and the living microorganisms and that organic matter working together, all right, is what helps form little aggregates in your soil, okay? So here's your soil without any microbes or any life. They're just little, they're just soil particles there. Now once the microbes start working, and everybody knows when you pick up an earthworm, it's kind of gooey and slimy, all right? Um, those microbes, the earthworms and the fungi, actually produce, one of their byproducts is, a, is kind of a glue. People have heard of glomalin, things like that. And it sticks your soil particles together. All right, and then they become in what we call an aggregated state. So you have organic matter bound up in there. You've got the clay. You got some plant roots. There's probably a few microbes hanging out in there. You got that protected organic matter we were talking about. All those great things. And then these aggregates kind of sit on top of each other very loosely in your soil, and that's what creates really good structure. Okay, just skip through that and. You were kind of asking a watershed question. And essentially, if you have a well aggregated soil, the water is going to be able to infiltrate into that soil much easily. And your plants will also be able to um, grow through that soil much easily as well. This is so important. I cannot overestimate or underestimate how important aggregated soil is to your farm. You want the water to go down through the soil. You do not want the water to run off the top, okay? Um, what I see in a lot of soil on a lot of farms is that people overwork their soils and they break those aggregates. And then what happens is the minute it rains, right, we pulverize our soils to death, and the minute it rains and then the sun comes out, this happens a lot, you get that little crust at the top of, okay, if anybody grows carrots here, this is really important, you get that crust over the top of your soil and your plants cannot germinate through it. That is a form of compaction and it's also a sign that your aggregates have broken down 
under rainfall, which means they are not resilient, like we talked about at the beginning. And if they're not resilient, that means you're not, you don't have as healthy soil as maybe you thought. Okay, so you really need to make sure you're getting that well aggregated soil. And this is just a picture of poor aggregation, good aggregation. Some more on that. This is um, a picture. I just I love showing this because this down here is a farm. This is Addison County Virgin's clay, a really hard soil to work in the state. This farmer, right, he was an organic farmer. They um, had grown a crop of sweet clover, yellow blossom sweet clover, the year before as a cover crop. They tilled that under the next spring and planted corn. They received 10 inches of rain in 48 hours. And we went out there uh, two days later. And this is what his soil looked like. You can see how resilient it was. That rotation that he was using helped the soil build these excellent aggregates that were resilient to the rainfall. You could hear the water percolating through the soil. And this was a soil relatively close by after the same rainfall, wasn't drying out at all like this one was, no aggregates here. So you can see the power of really getting it right with good rotations, the cover crops, adding the organic matter and building the soil. All right, so I know we, we need to wrap up here. Somebody was talking about the watershed again, and this is, if you want to know about erosion, this is erosion we get off a farm that has poor aggregated soil. You can see all the silt in the runoff versus a farm that has good aggregation soil. Okay, so not only are you helping your crops, you're helping the environment. So this is a really important take home message. All right, so let's end on taking a soil sample because I want you all to go do this. Very important. This is kind of the beginning, you know. Um, nutrients are important. And a standard soil test can tell you a lot of things about soil health as well. So taking a soil sample. First of all, really the best time to take the soil sample is, is about now. It's in the fall. It's not fall. I realize I'm ahead of myself. But, you know, going into September, um, we don't always have a lot of time to do this. It's still busy. But if you take your soil test now, September, you have time to do something this fall. By the time spring comes, you are so busy doing other things, you do not want to think about soil testing. And once you get your soil test back, you may not have time to make those changes you need to make. So now is a good time. All right, tools that you need. It's best to use a soil probe if you can get one. Um, a lot of extension offices have soil probes. You can actually buy them pretty cheap, these cheap little it's really not that much fun taking soil samples with this, but if you're just doing a few fields, um, you know, these work okay. You know, they're 20, 30 bucks through Gemplers, you can get them, forestry suppliers, Ben Meadows. Just type in soil testing probes and tons of sites will come up. All right, so what you want to do is get a soil probe or get um, a really thin garden trowel. They sell them through Johnny's and that allows you to take um, a sample a foot deep, okay? You don't want to really, you don't want to use a regular shovel. Um, you just don't get a good sample with that. If you're cultivating your crops, or so if you're growing vegetable crops, um, oh, go back here. If you're growing vegetable crops, you want to sample basically to the tillage layer. And for most of us, that's, you know, uh, six to 10 inches, maybe even 12 inches. So you want to get about a foot. Um, most soil probes will measure a foot. So if you have a soil probe, take a foot if you're, if you're tilling up the soil. Um, but you really need to get deep. Uh, what about a pipe, a hammer, and a plunger to push out the soil in the pipe? Sure. I mean, anything. You know, the key is just really making sure you get the right depth. Um, and, and these probes work pretty well. I think, you know, anything you can do to get that, you know, just make sure you get the right depth. If you're sampling your, um, if it's a hay field, something in a perennial crop, usually four inches is sufficient. All right, sample size. Um, people always say, well, how many sample probes do you take? Or how many probes do you, do you take? I'm assuming most of you are not on large areas. Um, 
And so if, if you have less than five acres, what's probably more important is how you break up your field. Okay, and I'm gonna I'll draw a little picture of how we sample our vegetable. We have about an acre in vegetables here, and how we sample our field. We have four four fields that we rotate to, and um, we take an overall sample of the one acre. So, um, if you're if you're fertilizing everything the same, then you'll take one soil sample from that area. So here's our one acre plot and what you would do is you'd walk in a random pattern and you would put your probe in the ground, you know, one acre is not very big but it's not going to take long to sample so kind of walk in a you know random pattern or a W pattern, something like that and take you know six to ten probes. Now this is where you can see if you're using a shovel you can be carrying a wheelbarrow or wheeling a wheelbarrow to get all the soil in it. That's why it's nice to use a probe, okay? So in each one of these spots, let's say 10 spots in an acre, which is kind of overkill, but it's not going to hurt, okay? And then what you do is you're carrying your plastic bucket. Gosh, I'm such an artist. Um, and you put each one of these probes in a very clean plastic bucket. Do not use a metal bucket because believe it or not, you can get shards into your soil samples. So a clean plastic bucket, put your each one of your cores in the plastic bucket, you're all done, you take that sample and you mix it up really well, okay? Mix it up very well, don't just pick out the pieces that look good, mix it up well and then take about, you need less than a quart size bag, you need about, has anybody ever seen these snack baggies? They're about, I guess it's half a quart maybe, you don't need much, okay? and you put that in the bag and then you're ready to send it off to UVM, okay? So now if you have an acre and over the last few years you've realized that the west side does really well. This side grows phenomenal crops but the east side doesn't, okay? And, you know, you've worked it a few years and you see, well, there's kind of a change in soil type here. It's nice and sandy up here, but it's really clay down here, okay? I would suggest that you take two samples. It might be worth fertilizing these differently. You may have down here in the clay end, um, you know, a higher pH or a lower pH or you may be lacking some nutrients here. Um, and this field may just be higher in nutrients, who knows, but if you're seeing some real production differences, you might want to split, split out that and take two samples, okay? It costs uh, $12 for a soil test and that was the last cost I saw, but this could, depends where you are too, so usually anywhere between $10 and $20. All right, so if you don't have the 10 bucks to spare or the 20 bucks, you know, just take one sample and it gives you something to go by. But if you have a little money to spare and you see some differences, then take a couple, all right? Now, oh, will UVM perform? Yes. Yes, UVM will perform soil tests to whoever sends them to them, all right? Okay, so once you have your sample in the snack baggie, uh, you're going to want to get it off to UVM as soon as possible. Now, if you if you don't have time to get to the post office, I've driven around for lots, I've driven a lot around with lots of soil tests in my truck, forgetting to bring them to Burlington or whatever. If you don't have time, you just had time to take it, put it on a piece of paper and dry it in the sun, okay? Then put it back in the bag and ship it off when you have time, all right? But it's best not to just throw it in your refrigerator for a month. It's better to dry it out and then bag it up and send it in. All right, so you can find the UVM soil test questionnaire online. You can also, you can see the mailing address here. That's where it gets mailed. Um, I think I can find, I'm hoping I can find this for you. Now it's really important to send out the questionnaire because, or to fill it out, because the questionnaires 
um, going to help the soil test lab send you back the recommendations, okay, for the crops that you're growing. All right, we'll go to that afterwards. So you need to fill this form out if you want to get good information back. This is not a very good slide. I wish I could zoom in or out, but I don't think I can. So once you get your soil test report back from UVM, you can feel free to call me. My number is on the bottom. Oh, here's a soil test site. Thank you, Jessica. All right, so Jessica just posted the soil test site, and that's where you can get those forms. Again, you can call me or email me uh, if you need any help with this afterwards. I'm more than happy to help you navigate through this, especially if it's your first time. I'm putting my phone number up here so you can call me. Oops, it's dark here. All right, send. All right, so once you get your soil test back, you're going to see a lot of things we talked about. Here's the pH up at the top. Okay, so you want to look at that. It's going to tell you um, these different nutrients. It's going to tell you how much phosphorus is in your soil, potassium, magnesium. There's aluminum, like we talked about, calcium. Zinc, it's going to show your cation exchange capacity. Here's 12.2. All right. And it's going to, it has this really nice chart for you to look at to kind of gauge where you're at. So on this particular soil test, you can see that this person's phosphorus is low. All right. 1.5 parts per million means nothing to you, really, for most people. But this does, right? It's low. So you know that you would, if it's low, you would definitely see yield increases if you added phosphorus to your soil. All right? And you can see the potassium level is medium. And when it's in the medium range, it means that you will most likely see increases if you add potassium to your soil. Okay? Now the next one is magnesium, and that's in the high range. Okay, if you're in the optimum or high range, optimum or high, that means that you will most likely not see any impact on your crop if you add magnesium to your soil. So essentially, your soil has enough magnesium in it, if it's in the optimum or high range, that if you're adding magnesium, you're probably wasting your money. Okay, so that's why it's really good to get these soil tests so you can figure out where, where you need, what areas of your soil you need to work on. All right, so the cation exchange capacity of this soil is 12.1. Now, you really want to be working to get your cation exchange capacity around 10 um, milli equivalents. In a, in a sandy soil, that's going to be difficult, but 10 is a nice um, cation exchange capacity that you know you're holding on to some of those nutrients. So that's what you should work towards. And again, if you're um, on a sandy soil, you're going to do that through adding organic matter. I can't even see the organic matter level on here, but I think it says, if I stop erasing all this stuff, um, I think it says 5.3. Okay? So that's pretty good. Most soils um, in Vermont should be around four or five. Again, if you have a sandy soil, it'll definitely most likely be below that. But that's something to work towards. Okay, so just, just to wrap this up a little bit, this, this is why down here where it says lime, when convenient, could you discuss the pros and cons of wood ash versus lime? Yes, I can do that. Um, let, I'll talk about that when I go through these lime and fertilizer recommendations. Now, the reason you need to fill out those forms, okay, is that UVM will give you nutrient recommendations for individual crops. So in this particular case, the farmer said that they were growing grasses only in this uh, pasture, conventional pasture. And you can see right here, it says lime and nutrients needed. So lime tons per acre. In this farmer's case, he or she does not need to add any lime. All right. If the pH was lower, like probably usually around 6.2, 
there will be a recommendation to add some form of liming agent. Right? And it'll tell you right here how many tons of lime. And here when it says lime, they mean calcium carbonate. So remember I showed you that list. And it's calcium carbonate. And that's mostly, this is mostly what's available. Now somebody asked about wood ash. So wood ash versus lime. Calcium carbonate or agricultural lime is about 90% what they call 90% uh, calcium carbonate equivalent. If you had pure calcium carbonate, you know, it would take exactly, this is just an example, one ton to change the pH of your soil by some percent. Because it's 100% calcium carbonate equivalent. When you buy agricultural lime, which is most lime you can buy, like I said, at Agway or some farm and garden store, it's about 80 to 90 percent of the pure form. Okay? That means you need to add just a little bit more to get the same effectiveness of the pure stuff. Okay? Wood ash is about anywhere from 50 to 70% of the pure stuff. So essentially you need to add twice as much wood ash to have the same impact on the pH as you would if you just added the lime. So hopefully that makes sense. Wood ash is, um, has calcium in it but it does not have as much as if you were adding pure calcium carbonate. So to get a change in the pH, you have to add about twice as much to the soil. All right? You, uh, does wood ash react fast in the soil? No, not necessarily. The, the material that's going to act the fastest is pure, pure calcium carbonate but it does act relatively fast. How fast the lime reacts has a lot to do with the particle size of the lime. So the finer it is, the quicker it reacts. And, um, but wood ash does, you know, react fairly quickly. You know, but you still need about a year to see some differences in the lime. The other nice thing about wood ash is if you need potassium or other micronutrients, wood ash has other benefits. So lime just has calcium carbonate, but wood ash has quite a bit of potassium in it. It also has a lot of micronutrients, including boron, which is generally deficient in Vermont soils. So I, I do really like wood ash as a liming agent. Um, it's usually relatively cheap <laughs> and um, also gives you these other benefits. So I, I do like using it. You have to be careful with all liming agents that you do not over apply them, okay? And that when you do apply them, that they're spread really finely across your plants or your soil. Um, this is especially, okay, we're almost running out of time. This is especially true if you're, um, if you have crops growing when you apply the lime, like, um, like pasture. So if you apply too much lime to it, it can be caustic to the plant. So you just have to be careful that it's spread um, really thinly. And, and it's hard to do that with wood ash because sometimes there's big clumps in it if you're getting the stuff right from the company. All right, well, I, I'm hoping that this has been helpful. <laughs> and it seems like we have a lot more to discuss and that maybe Jessica will have us do another webinar and we can get um, even more into building, you know, how we're going to keep building these healthy soils. You know, there's no recipe that I can give you folks. Um, you know, a lot of it, I guess, you know, in terms of what to recommend, you just need to make sure you're adding good amounts of organic matter, all right, and in many different forms. Don't get too fixated on one, one thing or the other, okay? We talked about these different um, types of organic matter, and when you're applying 
organic materials, it's sort of the same principles. You have living organic matter that you can apply, and that's your green manures, right, your plow down cover crops. And then you have sort of the, the partially or, or newly dead organic matter that you can apply to the soil, and that's like manure and lightly composted materials. And then you have sort of very dead organic matter that you can apply, and that's like really highly composted materials. And each one of those um, materials is going to do something different in your soil, okay? So in, in some ways, the best thing to do is to make sure you're getting all three in there and figuring out what each one does and what each one is adding to your crops. And I think that's a whole another uh, webinar in itself. So I think I should probably start there. I've blabbed enough. What about blood meal? I have not used blood meal, but it is a really, um, it's, a, it's a good source of nitrogen especially um, and a, a pretty readily available source. And I mean, I don't have any problems with it in particular. It would be a readily available source of nitrogen primarily. And a lot of people are looking at that, especially organic folks that need the nitrogen. How can you add organic matter without plowing or to perennial crops? So, um, you know, it's really hard in agriculture, especially in our area, to not work the soil. And I think um, there are no-till systems that are, you know, better. Uh, there are no-till systems for vegetable crops, such as pumpkins and sweet corn. And has anybody seen the roller crimper um, out there? It's something that we've been working with, the roller crimper. It rolls down cover crops, such as winter rye, and then you no-till plant into them um, with a no-till planter, and it helps with weed control. That's a, that's a big thing if you're an organic farmer with not tilling the soil, is how do you control the weeds? Um, you can definitely plant, but you can't, you know, it's harder to control the weeds if you're not tilling. Um, and to the methods, tools of applying, could you quickly mention the methods and tools of applying lime? Um, in terms of methods, a lot of people broadcast it with a spinner. So if you're on a really small scale, you can get one of those earthway spinners like broadcasters. Those work pretty well and they'll broadcast it out. You know, you need to look at the pattern um, of how it's broadcasting so that you don't overlap too much. And, and, um, or you can use a drop, uh, a drop fertilizer applier, like a little Gandy spreader. All those tools are available. If you t go to like earthway seeders or tools, you can see some of the examples on there. Again, Gemplers is a good place to look for those kinds of things, or Northern Tools. All those places are online. And, um, you know, make sure you calibrate them. That is really important. And if you need help calibrating a tool like that, just, you know, send me an email. There's lots of resources online that I can send you to, or, and I can instruct you myself as well. But it's important to calibrate so that you don't overapply. And it's hard on a small scale. I do understand that. So. All right. Any more sterilization of dirt with plastic? I've not. I've worked with that a little bit when I was out west um, in Oregon. It's becoming kind of all the rage. Um, I never thought we'd have temperatures hot enough in Vermont to make it work, but this summer I think we definitely could have done it. <laughs> so I, I would give it a give it a try. Um, I don't think we get hot enough temperatures to kill too many microbes. Hopefully you'd mostly just be killing little weed seedlings right in the surface. Most of your microbes, um, you know, are in the four to six inch range, so it probably won't get too, too hot. Um, but, hey, okay, give it a shot. Okay. So I think, I think that's okay. it. Okay. Well, Heather, thank you very much for um, being with us this evening, and thanks everybody for uh, participating in the webinar. Uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and type your email address into the chat box so we can send you some follow-up information. And this presentation will be uh, posted on the New Farmer website um, by the end of next week. So. Uh, 
look for it there as and I think we'll probably uh, post this uh, PowerPoint as a PDF as well. Um, so that's it. Everybody have a uh, good evening. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. Bye. Bye.